Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rethink Retail, the state of the grocery industry. The retail world is in a state of transformation today. We're navigating big challenges with global economies, with politics, climate change, new technology. And for the grocery sector, these challenges are particularly impactful, especially when it comes to supply chain and frontline labor. So to tackle the dual challenge of improving both employee and customer experience, Grocery retailers are finding new ways to empower their associates, empower them to better understand and serve customer expectations, yet also ensuring that back-end operations remain as efficient as possible. So that empowerment is the focus of our webinar today. We think retail has brought together two exceptional industry experts to explore how emerging technology can address this empowerment challenge and help retailers build frontline teams that can significantly improve their bottom line. So I'm very excited to introduce J.D. Dillon. He is the Chief Learning Architect at Exonify. Welcome, J.D. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Exonify? Sure. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Um, I like to describe my career as, as basically living a frontline-focused career. So uh, you may notice, if you look at my background, uh, I'm not a grocer. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. But what, what I do and where I specialize is enabling frontline teams. So I've spent my entire life focused on both the operational side of frontline workforces. So I used to manage movie theaters and theme parks. I live right behind Disney World. So I spent 10 years with the Walt Disney Company before I went to learning and development and enablement focused on frontline teams in retail environments, contact centers, hospitality environments, food service, and the like. And then for the past seven years or so with Exonify, I've been working with my team to enable frontline workers in a wide variety of industries, inclusive of retail and grocery. So right now we have uh, the, you know, the great experience of working with a couple of dozen different grocery retailers across the world, um, organizations like Kroger, Wakefern, Giant Eagle, Festival Foods, and the like. And uh, I've spent a lot of time for the past seven years, uh, I'd say more than half of my site visits have been to grocery stores and a lot of time understanding the day-to-day -day realities of what it's like to run a grocery business, specifically what it's like to be an associate, a department manager, a store manager within these environments, and then what it takes to make sure people have the knowledge, skill, and capability necessary to bring your customer experience and your business results to life. So that's what I do today as Chief Learning Architect at Exonify. Oh, it sounds like fun. And I'm also excited to introduce Scott Langdock. He is the Global Head of Grocery, Chain Drug, and Convenience Retail at AWS. That's Amazon Web Services. Scott, that sounds like a lot of work. Can you tell us about your role? I can. Thanks, uh, Deanne, very much. Uh, yeah, my role is to kind of work with retailers, grocery retailers, fast-moving consumer good retailers around the world, kind of on all of their you know, operational and technical requirements, strategy, uh, desire for innovation. I come from a CIO, CTO background, strategy consultant, industry analyst. So I kind of look at things through the lens of kind of both the operational and the technical, but with that common theme of how can we innovate? How can we drive costs down? How can we raise margins and profitability and ultimately drive a good brand experience? So um, my role is to advocate on behalf of our grocery customers um, as they think about cloud and digital innovation and this increasing focus, as you called out, on how can we improve, optimize, leverage uh, the value proposition of our associates and further enable them. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Great. And Scott, let's start with you. Um, just looking at big picture macro, have you seen real value generated by empowering frontline workers in grocery stores? Well, I, I think, you know, as the, the more associates are enabled, the more they contribute to us as shoppers uh, our sense of the brand experience of that grocer. Uh, it's a, a, stating the obvious, it's a hyper-competitive market. There's challenges for every grocery retailer, really regardless of where they operate. And the more the associate can actively participate in effective execution, information conveyance, um, you know, proper, you know, and more effective and efficient retail operations, the better the overall brand and store experience is. And so I think there's, you know, value generation on the economic level, there's value generation on the customer satisfaction level, and there's also 
value generation on the associates, you know, interest in and enjoyment for the job that they have. And I think if we focus on all of those, um, you know, it's 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 really ultimately a net positive. Oh, and uh, JD, what do you see? This is going to be a loaded question. What do you see as some of the most important factors that groceries should be considering to attract and retain these great workers? What are some of the foundational elements that a retailer should be looking at? In the diverse business that retail is, grocery sits in an interesting place. And it's one of the reasons I really enjoy working with grocers in that it is truly a community business. And that doesn't matter if you're a large national chain that has hundreds or thousands of stores or a smaller chain that just has a couple of stores in in one particular town. Your customer base is also your employee base and people come to your store for markedly different reasons and potentially, you know, as individuals, different reasons at different times based on not just what they need to buy, but where the grocery store sits within kind of their community experience. And I think, you know, grocers, I think, understand that. I think I'm a bit preaching to the choir in that regard and acknowledging that's what the reality of the business is. But really, you know, looking at how we enable associates to bring that kind of varied experience to life for customers, because some people just want to get in and out of the store as quickly as possible. And a self-checkout option is great. And I just, I know where the products are and I want to have a frictionless experience. I don't particularly need support. You just need to make that easy for me. And in some cases, visiting the grocery store may be my social outlet for this week. And I do want to have a more in-depth conversation. I want to kind of ride through the slow lane as it were and have a dialogue with the person behind the counter or the person behind the cash register point of sale system. So I think it's important to understand the varying roles that associates play on the front line and make the necessary investments in that experience. And I'm currently a bit on a pedestal right now with one particular topic. And I believe if you are looking at or asking questions around how do I hire more effectively? How do I get people onto the floor so I can manage my labor hours more effectively? How do I retain great workers more effectively? There's there's no one answer to all of those questions, but the biggest single answer to me and the common thread across all of those frontline enablement challenges is management, is how, how effectively are you investing in your department managers, your store managers, your supervisory team, anyone who has direct influence over the experience of work day to day for a store associate or a distribution associate. And I think for the last couple of years, especially store managers and department managers have been heavily burdened, right? They were heavily burdened just trying to keep the doors open, uh, dealing with changing demands from customers, um, dealing with staffing shortages and making up the difference and, you know, working 78 hours a week just to keep their department running. And that kind of list of things that we're asking them to do has grown more and more. And on that list, but often getting buried underneath a lot of administrative work is take care of your team, right? And foster the type of community experience that is likely to retain people. And all of the research that I've done in grocery and retail shows me that people are much more likely to stay for two reasons. One, they like the people they work with and two, they trust their manager. So investing in managers and making sure that they have the support needed so that they have permission to better take care of their teams, I think is the most direct line to improving not just the employee experience and effectively enabling employees, but ultimately improving the customer experience that those associates are accountable for. Uh, Excellent. So on the kind of the flip side of that, on the retailer side of that, Scott, um, what are you seeing as far as some major trends that impact the grocery sector today? And are you seeing the role of associates evolve since your time as a grocery executive? Yeah, I, I mean, from a macro trend standpoint, I mean, there's probably too many to to talk about uh, in the time we have today. But you know, given the focus, I think the one that really has risen for the reasons I think we all know, um, you know, inflationary pressures, interest rate rising, the 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 transition, the aggressive transition to a hyper focus on cost reduction has been. Um, overwhelming in a, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, that's not to say there isn't innovation or new investment being made, but there is a significant driving force on how do we reduce the operating expense, uh, which of course labor being, you know, the largest, you know, variable component of that. How do we, how do we, you know, you know, do that while at the same time, you know, create that brand experience, create a level of differentiation in a hyper-competitive market. Those, those are often in conflict with each other. So as JD said, I, there are a lot of areas where 
this focus on the associate, giving them the information they need, empowering their managers to be effective managers with those associates. I couldn't agree with what JD said more um, about the the importance of you know quality of managers, hiring of managers, investing in managers, as, as he noted. And 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 the one ad I would bring to that is information is power, and we see a lot of trends where. If those managers are equipped with the right kind of, you know, data and telemetry and information that will help guide associates to do what they need to do. In other words, they can sort of support based on, you know, hey, you know, there's there's particular reasons we need this event or this promotion or this action to take place. That helps the associate to understand the importance, to understand the priority. So the more we can equip managers, the more we can, you know, invest in them with, you know, the ability to sense and respond to things effectively, um, that will contribute to that associate's uh, view of, of how they're being managed. Um, so that cost reduction thing, how do we how do we become effective in execution? How do we um, make sure the labor is being invested where it needs to be invested. Um, we don't need to have, you know, five people surrounding self-service functions. We need people able to answer questions and be skilled in the areas of the store where that customer engagement is most crucial. So um, anything that contributes to that brand experience and that shopper satisfaction um, that that's, is, is what needs to be the priority focus when it comes to associates. Well, and drilling down on that a little bit further, um, going a little bit deeper, JD, have you seen how have you seen technology change the role of the store associate and and what they do as in terms of customer experience? And I'll use an example with more grocers leaning into e-commerce and self-checkout automation, et cetera. What new tasks are you seeing that store associates are being asked to take on? The last three years has been interesting. Uh, understatement of the decade, but I think it's really changed the expectations of, of what we expect from associates. And at the same time, you know, grocers struggle to find people who come through the doors with a particular skill set. So you mentioned that, you know, when you look at how bills, businesses dealt with the pandemic and then how they dealt with the limited options when it came to staffing, we've seen a lot of introduction of technology and automation in the store. We've already mentioned e-commerce picking self-checkout, <laughs> And the, you know, now people are expected to deliver and drive a vehicle as part of being yeah. a grocery associate and drop uh, grocery, f find someone's home and then effectively fulfill you know, the request in terms of how they drop off uh, products at the, at the front door. So I think what's been true consistently is that despite the introduction of these different business models and these different technologies, you know, the associate still is front and center in the customer experience overall, it's just the role that they play has evolved. And one of my favorite examples is how they interact with customers over text when fulfilling an online order. And I had that experience in 2020 because I had not ordered groceries before. So it was the first time I was, I was having a text message conversation with a grocery associate who's trying to figure out what I prefer it, when it comes to produce selection. That's a different skill set when it comes to not just what you're hiring people for, but what you're training people to do in terms of how they interact with customers, right? Having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone who has a question about where a product is versus now you're having, you know, kind of building a relationship, especially if you shop for the same person over and over again. You're playing a bit more of a contact center agent role when you're doing kind of e-commerce fulfillment in that regard. So I think, and then you, you, know, you look at self-checkout, people who man the self-checkout self station, they're playing... A, a balancing act of roles between their partially customer service in terms of making sure, you know, self-checkout works appropriately. People get what they need. People get help. They're also troubleshooting their technology, IT troubleshooting to a certain extent. Why is this machine not working? What are the common tricks in order to make sure I get that station back up and running? They're also playing a loss prevention role. And when it comes to the question you asked earlier around trends, I mean, the conversation I'm having more and more with retailers at large, inclusive of the grocers, is conversations about workplace violence and organized retail crime. So we're having that type of conversation as well, where now associates are trying to play these different parts, but do it in an environment where they're increasingly uneasy. Uh, some of the research we did showed that 40% of grocery employees are scared to go to work right now just because of the circumstances they face. And more than 50% have witnessed a theft event take place in the past six months. 
So we're asking people to do different types of work in an increasingly challenging environment. And in a lot of cases, it's work that they haven't done before, even if they have spent some time in grocery. So I think that's where, as previously mentioned, there's an, there needs to be an increased importance around making sure people get or have access to information, can, can find the information they need to fulfill these different types of roles, not having to rely on my manager who's got a lot going on or not just relying on the person next to me who may or may not know what's going on or may have started yesterday for all we know. And then also an increasing relevance to finding ways to upskill and continuously develop people so that not just can they do the core requirements of their jobs effectively and feel comfortable in their ability to make a good decision and be able to deal with the challenging situation, but also continue focus on upskilling your team so that you're building back bench strength that you might have lost over the past couple of years so that you have the right candidates in place to be the next supervisor, the next department manager, the next store manager, and the like. Because that's another conversation I've been having from a talent strategy perspective is, you know, what, what has changed over the past couple of years as senior um, employees have retired or people have maybe moved on to different industries and used their transferable skills in different ways. So there's a bit of a long game to be played, but it really starts with making sure people have the, the comfort level, the confidence and the capability to do what's asked of them now in a more kind of diverse workplace and a more challenging workplace than we were even in just a couple of years ago. Wow. And just a follow-up question for that. Um, you got me thinking. Um, so checkout is a great example. A lot of uh, grocery ret retailers are adding them in. Some are taking them away. Um, it's really a changing and movable feast right now. What is the role of frontline staff in making sure that checkout experience is a positive one for the customer? And can this be balanced with the efficiencies of self-checkout in a way that is cost-effective and still supporting a good customer experience? Yeah, that's what I mean in terms of training our teams to make sure that they're capable of delivering the experience the customer needs at that time. So, that's broader than making that's that's more than just being transactional in the way that we interact with people. It's it's recognizing that people come to the store for different reasons and we're trying to deliver an experience that's consistent with our brand promise and you know is is the reason to come back into the store and not go to a competitor or not just rely on delivery options that may be outside of your brand, right? But understand you know making sure our, our people have the awareness and the skills necessary to engage in those different ways, while also making smart decisions for for the you know, operation. And you know, I think there's there's an it's an interesting conversation around self checkout now. As you said, you yeah. see some brands leaning in, some brands just outright saying we will never do it, and then some brands taking out where they maybe over rotated into that experience and then saw pushback from customers. Mm -hmm. So I think it's making sure that if I and this is true at my local grocery store, right? I recognize the employees. I make decisions about what I'm gonna do in my checkout experience based on who is sitting where. It's not just what's the shortest lane. I'm looking at the people because I know what the experience is like with that person. I know what the conversation is gonna be like with that person. What am I in the mood for right now? So, so making sure that our teams understand that and that they're able to deliver uh, that type of an experience. So that's where I think upskilling people, especially people who don't have retail backgrounds, haven't worked in grocery for a while. This might be their first job overall. They've never interacted face to face with the public, especially at this scale and this speed. So helping them understand, you know, how do I, for lack of a better term, get into the head of the customer to say, this person clearly just wants to get out of the store. We're going to have an efficient but polite interaction. We're just going to transact and we're done. This person might want to have a bit more of a conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the weekend or, you know, what they're buying their, their groceries for, what type of meal they're preparing later today. So really helping people flex their kind of comfort level and that interaction um, while keeping certain things like safety and efficiency top of mind because you know those those don't go away despite what type of interaction you may be having with a customer so that's a that's a more complicated skill set than i think most people think about it as being able to flex to the needs of the individual customer but it also what makes it a, an interesting challenge and an interesting environment in a grocery store yeah absolutely an interesting job scott touching briefly on the customer side um, has the customer experience taken a big hit in the grocery sector today because of the labor challenges we've been talking about? And is technology able to help in improving the grocery shopper's experience? Well, I think we've been talking a little bit around this, um, in, in, you know, on, on a higher on a higher plane. I, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, the the what what I see and what we see is 
the there, there's sort of you know leadership in the sector and then there's sort of laggards in the sector in terms of how they are are working to maximize optimize improve um you know that that associate driven uh store experience brand experience uh, in the face of these labor challenges whether it's retention whether it's recruitment whether it's skill set um you know we do know that you know that there is a you know a higher level challenge of that initial skill set of hiring people in because in some cases um especially in outlying departments like deli and and fresh departments there's a you know a need for for those skills and those are harder to find and harder to, to train in but i i do think that you you could argue that there has been an effect but i think the the those leaders that i'm referencing are the ones that are making maximum use and proper allocation of those associates they're training them their information equipping them they're giving them the capabilities be that technology or direction that helps them be more effective more efficient um, in their engagement with customers and their contribution to the store operations um, again i'm not trying to minimize the labor challenges that 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 exist um, and they have they, they they come from multiple angles, right? The the sheer supply of labor, the cost of labor, um, the fact that labor is being redistributed in, in uh, to activities that weren't there three years ago, like having to fulfill digital orders. Um, so there's a you know a, a high level challenge in how how that labor, how those associates can in fact be maximized. Um, as, and and so for those that aren't necessarily seeing. The effectiveness of their associate investment that are being more challenged than maybe their competitors really do have to think about what both JD and I are saying about where those areas of potential investment are that they should probably put more attention, more focus on, so that they can again maximize the labor that they do have and become a a more attractive place for people to want to come and work. That's really fascinating. Um it kind of it's got it's got me thinking and and this could be a question for you JD are there areas in the grocery store that are especially challenging in light of what Scott has said um either maintaining enough staff or serving up the right customer experience and is there a way to help resolve some of these departmental and operation specific challenges two areas that jump to mind based on conversations i've had is one specialty departments so the types of departments and we've mentioned things like bakery, deli, pharmacy, the, the places where someone just can't walk in off the street and do this job. So you, you traditionally might have leaned into people who have done this job for different brands before or in, in related industries. And I know that grocers are struggling to find those people at the gate so that they have to build that talent in order to keep that pipeline moving as opposed to being able to reliably hire out. Um, second place I would go is anything that's a physically demanding type of a job. So I know that there are several grocers out there who have kind of changed their their labor strategy and their talent strategy to lean a bit more into gig workers and you know de delineating when do I need an employee and when do I need hands, right? When do I need someone who's going to be able to complete tasks but they don't necessarily understand our brand experience, our customer service model, they're not necessarily going to be directly interacting with customers on a regular basis. And how do I leverage, uh, you know, a different talent pool in order to deal with changes in volume or seasonal activities or, you know, so I can move the people around the store based on their skill set and really run my store through the capabilities of my people in a way that helps me balance my costs while not sacrificing the customer experience. So I, I think over the last couple of years, some different companies have really thought outside the box in terms of how do I, how do I deliver this experience and how do I get the work done without locking into that mentality that, well, you're a cashier, you're front end, that's what you do. Or you, you're a deli associate, that's what you do. And I think there's, there's complexities within that, an example being uh, you know, unionized environments where you may not be able to cross train people into different functions because it actually repre is represented by a different union. So someone who's behind the seafood counter may not be able to work on the front end as compared to someone who works in the deli, uh, deli counter. So, but overall, I, I'm having a lot more conversations around topics like cross training because people are recognizing that, you know, certain parts of my store have different demand at different times. So my ability to move people around not only adds agility to my manager's ability to run the store, but it also potentially adds variety to the working experience for associates, which might be attractive in order to drive retention. And even better, it might add earning potential 
Because if I can do one thing in the store, I might not be able to get the next promotion or get the next transfer into another environment. But if I can do multiple tasks or if I can handle multiple positions, it may put me higher on the list to get promoted or it may just come with a boost in pay if I do different types of work. So it, it introduces a level of flexibility and variety into the associate experience, as well as adding agility to the operation. So I think you know it's important for, and I've seen success in organizations that take that step back and say, let's think more broadly about the employee experience and the kind of talent strategy we're applying within potentially different types of stores, because you may operate a, you know, within a brand that the store formats are different. So the store associate requirements are different. The skill requirements are different. So let's think more broadly about how we manage our business through the capabilities of our people versus always kind of thinking about a person as a role. And it's now thinking about a person as a diverse skill set that can really you know, have a different type of impact on our business. That's a great response. And uh, I have a follow-up question that, Scott, I, this might be a question for you. And, and that is around measuring some of the things that JD does just talked about. It sets up a, a complex, um, a complex environment of understanding what's going on and and cross pollination of data. Are you seeing any um, anything coming from the companies that you're working with in terms of a struggle or a resolution around measuring and resolving? Um, you know, do they do they have an expected set of results already? Are they are they still trying to figure out what to look at and and how to put that data together to tell a meaningful story? Yeah, I I mean I think that challenge has existed uh, you know for for quite some time across the entirety of retail. You know, the effective and quantitative measurements of associate effectiveness, associate productivity. But I think the measures have you know have changed you know over over time as I as I noted before. You know, there's there's a a, a more uh, you know subjective um, measurement criteria around that employee's contribution to the brand experience, customer satisfaction, things like that. That I know uh, a lot of retailers are working to um, c- you know convey and communicate to associates their role in that um, uh, on a po- you know kind of as a positive enforcement you know uh, level that it's not just you know labor based hour you know uh, hour by hour you know you know work in retail operations it is truly contributing to the you know to the success and differentiation of the brand experience i think i think what and and, and to make this go in a slightly more you know technology enablement uh, uh realm what 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 we're what we're really seeing become helpful to this cause is um, the use of more um, efficient and capable task management systems, things that you know give more consistent guidance to associates about the things they sh- you know can be doing that na- they need to be doing on a regular, consistent basis, um, giving them implicit training on those things. So if they have you know here's an assignment, but if you're not clear on the assignment, here's some additional information or some, uh, you know, learning capability to help you, you know, guide in uh, doing a promotional setting or to, um, you know, be effective in, an, in, in, in one of the more complex departments. So we're, we're seeing that, that the use of those kinds of solutions um, be helpful in, uh, you know, contributing to measuring effectiveness of, of, of associates, their contribution, their, their completeness of, of effort, and and then and then having that be uh, communicated back to the employees so that they know how they're doing. And again, almost to the very beginning of this discussion, that becomes an, another uh, enablement tool for the manager to have that effective, you know, development-oriented um, relationship with the associate. That again, I think all of us as employees um, appreciate knowing where we are and knowing what you know can be. Uh, what, how we're doing and what we could be doing better. Those kinds of feedback loops are really important. Some of it is subjective, but an increasing amount of it is objective and measurable in light of the kind of the sensing and and uh, you know management related tools that are being deployed in store operations today. We have a question here from uh, LinkedIn actually that I thought I think it fits in to this uh, slot really well. And uh, one of our one of our watchers is asking, how grocery clients are using technology to identify employees who might have uh, leadership potential. How is the path made clear for the front line around that? I think that's a great question. 
And uh, I'll throw it out to both of you to see if, which one wants to answer that. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Sure. I, I, I saw a comment um, sim- along similar lines. It might have been from the same individual who uh, talked about the idea of you know how often we use the term labor and kind of make gen- we make general statements about frontline employees at, at large, inclusive of retail associates. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity to reestablish or kind of elevate a sense of equity and fairness in the frontline workplace right now. Technology gives us a part of that, but I think it's just the overall trend is in that direction. And I, you know, if you, one of the biggest stats I saw on a research report my de- team did earlier this year wrapped around frontline employees was the fact that only 39% of frontline employees feel heard. And that's down from 59% last year. So it's not just how low that number is, it's how low that number is going. And, you know, associates know, right? They, they know what it feels like to be treated like a number who is replaceable. And we talk about, you know, the importance of maintain, you know, retaining great workers and helping them execute. But then the question is, how much do we invest in that experience? And I think we have a tremendous opportunity right now to restore equity to the experience in small but meaningful ways. And, you know, one of the ways I, I can speak to is um, when we talk, you know, let's talk about AI. How long did it take? 32 minutes. All right. So when you talk about AI, you know, there's a lot of conversations around generative AI and different ways it's enhancing business processes and automation, these types of things. But one of the things I'm most excited about, or one of the use cases I'm most excited about is the fact that we can now put the same information in the pockets of every retail associate as we can into the pockets of the corporate team. Because now, instead of you having to know where to go, or you having to work behind a computer, you having to know how to navigate your SharePoint instance, you can now just ask for whatever information that may be. And it might be, what's my time off policy uh, based on how long I've been here, or it can be what wine best pairs with this particular cheese, because a customer is asking me, and I'm 16 years old, and I don't drink wine, and I have no idea how to upsell, but I know how important it is to upsell this cheese, because that's what the store manager's really been harping on, is making sure we we can answer questions about these products. And now there's a leveling happening through AI where we can make sure that anyone can get the information they need. And the great leveler is not just the ability to ask the question and get an answer back instead of just get a link back, which is where we've lived for the last 20 years when it comes to knowledge management. Um, the ability to get that answer back in a way that suits me as an individual. <clears throat> so if I maybe don't speak English as my first language, That's a really hard problem to overcome in a lot of cases right now, because how many languages are you going to author all of your reference material in? Most organizations don't have the time and resources to handle every possible language. You pick a couple. In my past, you usually pick two or three. What are the most commonly spoken languages? Now AI can handle that for us, where we're building technology where you ask the question in any language, it responds in your language preference, but the source material could be written in English. But you ask the question in Spanish, we answer you in Spanish. So there's an equity layer there. And one of the other things I'm really excited about is we can also take into account things like educational background and reading level. Maybe you're not the strongest reader, right? So you're not going to potentially be able to understand this document that was clearly written by a lawyer for use by lawyers, but now available to all employees. We can distill that information down into a more useful format based on your preferences or your background and your experience. So there's a great leveling happening right now through technology that I think is going to elevate the fairness that comes through within the frontline workplace. And the other thing I would add that more directly answers the question is also being able to use our understanding of the associate experience, data associated to that experience to identify people who want to go further and maybe haven't thought about it before. Because some people may actively raise their hand and say, I am interested in a career and that's where I I want to be considered for the next promotion. But there may be people out there who are really good at the key skills we need Maybe they're not the best employee, but they're really, there's potential there. And we just can't see it because they haven't raised their hand. And maybe they don't talk to their manager often enough. And we rely on a lot of subjective perspective of work when it comes to the frontline employee experience. <laughs> so what we're hoping is that by having a better understanding of that ex- employee's experience day to day, you know, what they're learning, how their knowledge and behavior is changing over time what their sentiment is, what they're potentially interested in, right? What types of learning activities they're jumping into because now they have more access to these types of opportunities. We can identify people who are 
subtly raising their hand, but not doing it in a way that your HR person or your your store manager may not have noticed. So I think we're we're at this moment now where we can really make work what individuals want it to be, because I think we all have to acknowledge that not everyone in the store or in the distribution center is there for a career, right? A lot of people are there because they need a paycheck. They need to take care of themselves. They need to take care of their family. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Some people do want to develop additional opportunities. And I think what they all have in common is that everyone wants to do a good job and wants to feel like they're supported in doing a good job, even if they're not going to be here that long. Maybe someone who's not going to be here that long today, because they get the right support, they realize this might be a place that they want to stay a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity right now in technologies accelerating some of that to really restore fairness and equity and be able to elevate people to opportunities that we might not have been able to do before when it was just relying on you know, who the manager happened to see perform the loudest yeah. uh, over time. Yeah. And uh, um, Scott, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? That's that was quite a comprehensive answer. So yeah, I, I don't know how I that. could. I, I, I don't know how I could follow that long answer. So I'll just uh, let it sit there. Um, I, I do think uh, we're also getting more uh, commentary from LinkedIn and talking about training matrices and learning and development options. And I think there it, there's a real um, divergence in um, an interesting time here. And that maybe Scott, you might have some insight into this. Is I'm seeing a lot of studies that are showing a big gap between um, what executives think workers want and what workers actually want. What is really going to move the needle for them? And I don't know if you're having any experience around that as well. And are there are executives in these grocery retailers actively trying to understand the needs of the employee on the front line? And are they spending enough time in their stores? Are they interacting enough with the people who have boots on the ground to really create learning technologies and programs and um, personalization that is that is going to move the needle? And in other words, uh, the the tools that are out there um, are are they tools that employees are finding useful, or are they just sort of a first draft attempt at trying to get something out there. You know, my 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 sense is, and I'll, I'll be somewhat anecdotal about this, is that, well, no, let, let, let me be a little more direct. The answer to your question is I, 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 I see a lot more effective feed la feedback loops being used by grocery retailers that I think sort of begins to degrade that that thinking that, you know, senior leadership isn't aware of the temperature of or the trends that or priorities that are driving associate thinking. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but I do think that we're living in a world where the mechanisms and the technology enablement for that feedback loop are significantly broader than they have been in the past, A, and B, you have an employee base that has grown up in the social media era, era where feedback has just become you know, a sort of a, a natural element of one's personality, not but for everybody, but there are often, if the mechanism exists to communicate upward, there are many more that will take advantage of that and communicate. In some case, it's subjective, you know, temperature taking kinds of data collection. And in other cases, it's true survey measurement, right? It's sort of you know, get, you know, gaining insights at a level of granularity so that you know for a particular associate, any particular market, in a particular department, doing a set of particular jobs, what their sense and feeling and, you know, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas are, never mind the fact that some of the best ideas, operational ideas, improvement ideas, new thinking ideas are coming from those same feedback loops. So if, if employees can know that not only the, they're being heard, but some of their suggestions and ideas are actually being acted on and, get, and, and leadership is giving credit to the associates for contributing to that, um, I, I think that's a net positive. I see that in, in many different um, grocery retailers that I work with around the world. I see it in my own company um, in terms of the value of, of um, you know, that feedback loop and that acknowledgement that we're being heard. 
So I think that's a, a really important thing is that there's more of that feedback loop and a constituency that's used to providing feedback and interaction. And I think that's contributing to more information about employee sentiment, not less. Wow. Um, I, that's a great answer, Scott. I'm going to throw this question to you, JD, but Scott, you may have input as well that's valuable. And it's really, uh, I see a lot of companies very focused on digital transformation. Do you think this is getting in the way of a focus on staffing transformation? Or are you seeing that staffing transformation really start to unfold and happen? Or do you think it's happening too slowly? And what would be a good first step for a retailer who feels like they need to shift their priorities onto staffing a little bit more aggressively? We're in an interesting, again, transitional moment where there's a stat out there, I can't remember exactly where to attribute it to, but basically says that 1% of enterprise technology spend goes to frontline workers. Now, that's not to say that, you know, there's a lot of technology that's in their hands being used on the job, whether it's, uh, you know, devices that they're using uh, to pick uh, online products, or we mentioned self-checkout. Technology is a part of the experience of being a retail associate today. Um, but how much of that technology is built to better my experience as opposed to execute on corporate priority? And I think because of the last couple of years, there were some fundamental challenges and fundamental opportunities that arose. So in the beginning of 2020, uh, I talked to a lot of different retailers and they were struggling with basic things like how does the corporate team send a message to the entire frontline team? Because traditionally the answer is you send an email to some divisional layer of management and then it filters its way down. Does it actually get there? Depends. <laughs> and how quickly does it get there? Well, depends when the people are working. The answer is not today in a lot of cases for most associates. So there, there were struggles at that basic level of just how do I talk to my associates, yet alone how do we retrain people on how to interact with customers on new safety protocols and these types of ideas. But simultaneously, there was an opportunity happening. So in 2018, I had a conversation with the CIO of a grocery chain in the Northeast. We were talking about bring your own device. And they were talking about how they wish that they could do yeah. it, right? They saw the opportunity. They know everyone's carrying a phone. Not everybody, but a, a huge chunk of their workforce is carrying a phone. It's a great device, but red tape, dot, dot, dot. That vanished in the last couple of years where we're now having less bring your own device conversations. We're having a lot of choose your own device conversations because the, again, reality is that not everyone has a smartphone. Not everyone wants to use their smartphone for work or, you know, in whatever environment they're in and may not be able to use that type of device. But there are a lot of different screens now that didn't exist three years ago inside of a retail environment, whether it be a Zebra device, uh, a large touch screen that's on the back of the deli scale, uh, the point of sale system, right? We went from a world where we were literally time uh, stop watching people to see how long it took them to get from their department to the one computer in the back of the store and then back with the information that they were looking for to a world where we now have a bevy of devices and it's how do we make sure that our technology, our content, our information, our overall strategy maximizes that access point because it now, it's, it's a better situation than we've previously been in. So I think there's, there's a tremendous opportunity when it comes to kind of the digital transformation of the workplace and of the operation to leverage and kind of ride on the coattails of some of that transformation to say, how are we using those same tools to improve the experience of what it's like to work here? Uh, because again, <laughs> associates, broadly speaking, regardless of age, have an expectation of how technology can influence their ability to live their day-to-day -day lives. I always love to point out that, you know, when you're at home, you can solve amazingly complex problems, right? Your refrigerator breaks. The first thing you generally don't do is call up repairman and you definitely don't go to refrigerator repair school to fix that problem, right? You Google it, you go to YouTube, you find a person who's solved that problem before, you try it out, see if you could save yourself some money. And all of that behavior that's been built into us for the last 20 years that kind of vanishes when you go into the workplace a lot because, all right, I have a problem. Where do I go? What do I look up? Which repository do I go to? Who do I ask? It, especially if I'm a new associate who doesn't have a lot of professional experience. So I think we have an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to level set a lot of that and enable people to activate a lot of the behaviors that they're used to using in everyday life. And now we've suddenly put a lot more access points into the workplace. And a lot of people are carrying one on their person, 
Um, so I, I know there's still a lot of questions and struggles around people using different types of devices. There's still plenty of conversations to be had there. But we now have a chance to really elevate the employee experience through technology with data and AI and devices as we've been elevating the customer experience for the last couple of years, as we've been trying to find that balancing act between in-store activity, e-commerce and the like. So following up on that thought too, uh, are those devices useful in, and uh, are they impacting the training process for these retailers? One of the biggest challenges with, with training in a retail environment is just the disruption that takes place to the operation. Because again, with, with the costs of, of hourly associates, it's the biggest lever you have from a budgetary perspective, and you often schedule the people you need to run the operation. So if you say, well, I need to pull two people from the deli counter for two hours worth of online training, you just destroyed the customer experience and you're overburdening the people who are left behind in the operation to make up for those hours, or you now have to schedule additional people and you may, those people may not exist, mm -hmm. right? Especially in specialty areas. So the the conversation I often has is instead of talking about training as if it's it, training is not school, basically in the workplace. I think a lot of people still have that kind of industrialized mentality that for someone to learn something new, we have to sit them down in a place for an extended period of time, give them a test at the end. They got a passing grade. They have learned they will change what they do on the job. They will be better now. That's not how anything works. Learning never worked that way. So what we try to do is instead of thinking about learning in terms of courses, we think about learning in terms of minutes, specifically five minutes a day, right? Because every associate, even in the busiest environment, there is five minutes that we can find to carve out in that day to focus on your development. And what we try to do is build this habit where learning how to you know, do something new on the job or refining your skills or reinforcing things you really need to know, instead of being a disruption to the job, it becomes just a built-in task that you do every day. And I work with one of the largest grocery chains in the Southeast United States, and they've been a customer of Exonify's for almost 10 years at this point. And what's really interesting is when you have that, you know, when you work with one company for 10 years, you've been working with hundreds of thousands of different associates over that time based on turnover, right? So it's not like it's the same people. Some of the people are still there, um, but a lot of associates have turned over. And they've been able to maintain a 98% engagement level in training. And by engagement, I mean 98% of their associates, pretty much every shift, log in and do a couple of minutes of training. Why do they do that? Well, one, they've built the habit. It's an expectation. It's just something you do at work. It's not something that pulls you away from work. And two, they've used their data to personalize that experience so that when you log in for your couple of minutes of training today, it is something for you. It's something you're struggling with or something that's new to you. Whereas the other person who works on the front end logs in to do their training today, same job, it's something different because mm -hmm. it's what they're struggling with or what they're focused on, what they're trying to achieve. So I think, again, we have this, this opportunity to elevate the learning and development experience for uh, grocery associates based on there's now more access points device-wise, <laughs> um, more data, more ability to personalize, and then more ability to blend. That's the last thing I'll comment is that you know, recognizing that learning, what is the most uh, desired training met uh, method that frontline associates ask for? It's hands-on training, right? It's not digital training. It's someone helping me learn how to do the job because I'm doing it in real life. So we can blend that experience to make sure we're guiding people to work through those uh, on-the-job experiences, but give them that foundational knowledge and then reinforce that through digital means. So we can create an overall better and more supportive experience by taking advantage of how you know, technology has evolved and our capabilities through data and AI have evolved even over the last couple of years. Scott, just following up on that, um, you're working with a lot of different industry sectors, convenience, retail, pharmacy. Are you seeing a, a challenge or a, a mastery in, in how they balance the technology needs and the, the human resource needs and in other words how they're are they maintaining are they are they struggling to maintain a customer connection and operational yeah. efficiency you know in a way that that is meaningful you know again the common thread of the three industry segments i mm -hmm. i repre represent um is sort of fast moving consumer goods of those three grocery has because of what we've been talking about you know had this pretty dramatic um, impact and transformation, you know, that was COVID driven that, uh, you know, has ended in not ended has, you know, 
made a higher priority this need for the associate to have a more active role in the brand experience. Um, elements of the associate role are in fact being automated, they are being made more efficient, but that again is um, thus freeing that associate up to be more customer facing, more customer engaged, more information equipped, as I said, to contribute to the, to the uh, um, overall you know, brand experience. Um, you know, similar themes in, in, in pharmacy, um, and obviously pharmacies exist in grocers as well. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the, the role that AI can play, the role that additional information can play. So there's a particular initiative around how can we combine, you know, with appropriate privacy controls, you know, information um, and, and our relationship with a customer to participate in shopper health management, for example, you know, elements in terms of, you know, food and recipe and health guidance or, um, you know, uh, diet guidance with, you know, uh, particular, you know, needs that they have from a, you know, pharmacy perspective. Those are those kinds of things. Associates have a role to play, right? Um, it, 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 you know, the, the, it, the information that can be exchanged at a pharmacy counter is really important, right? It's a part of, it, it's, it's an element of patient management. And the more information equipped a pharmacy technician is in support of a pharmacist, the more effective that engagement is going to be with any one of us who want that information, uh, you know, for picking up a prescription, for example. Um, you know, the, of the three segments I represent, convenience is very interesting because convenience is still a, uh, a you know, has its focus on convenience, but it is also a participant in uh, the transition of many convenience stores as we know them to be, you know, small, uh, uh, grocery oriented, you know, uh, uh, retail locations with prepared foods and obviously the uh, energy retail capabilities. But but again, the role of the associate across all of those industry segments is, is fairly consistent. They need to be better equipped, more information um, ready, um, you know, the, the, a, a participant in the work that they're doing. Uh, you know, and, and as we talked about before, the feedback loops and things like that. So I, I think, um, you know, grocery remains the area where I think the most effect and impact can be drawn, but it applies, all, you know, in, in many ways, very similarly in pharmacy and convenience. We're getting up on time. I wish we had another hour because there's so much that we haven't had a chance to get into, like partnerships, but that'll be for part two, perhaps. Um, I would like to ask a final question, kind of looking ahead. What... Um, JD, what are you most excited about for the grocery sector as we look towards the next few years? Again, as someone who's not not living this day to day, I'm I'm here to be helpful when I can, based on what I understand about enabling frontline workers and the connection that that has to being successful as a business. But the the last couple of years for me have felt like this this unfortunate but meaningful learning exercise. So really trying to figure out what is that, where is this business going, right? The, the, in the beginning of 2020, we all had this over rotation to say the future is online. Everyone's going to be delivering <laughs> groceries, right? And that's, that's what it's going to be. <laughs> and now we're kind of seeing that trajectory fall back in terms of the growth that we saw, kind of the growth trajectory from, from 2019. So it's not, hasn't gone back. It's still at a higher level, but it's growing at a more realistic level. And then we already mentioned kind of the, the self-checkout exploration. You know, how is that being influenced by both what we want to deliver as a customer experience and then as factors like theft um, and, you know, costs associated to and, and all of these different things. So I think we're at this moment in time where we're going to be able to start making decisions about what we want the next phase of this business and this customer experience to be. And then what does it take to bring that to life? And then from a, an associate perspective, <laughs> You know, we're, we're leveling out a, a decent amount, not in every region and every part of the business, but when it comes to kind of what the workforce looks like and what our options look like. And I always talk about from a learning and development professional perspective, it, it's the conversation needs to begin with what is the work that's going to be required? And then what types of knowledge and skill do we need to build in order to help execute that work to achieve our business goals? And I think we're hopefully you know, 24 is at a kind of level set moment where we understand what this business needs to be and what our brand needs to be and what our customer experience needs to be, to be competitive, to be able to manage our costs effectively, to deal with you know, macroeconomic challenges. And then as a result, here's what we need our employee experience to be. 
And my biggest hope is we don't leave behind the sentiment that we've had for the past couple of years, because we were very pro frontline workforce, right? And we, we talked a lot about the role that these folks played in terms of keeping the doors open and elevating that experience and being there when we needed them. Hopefully we maintain that sentiment, obviously at a realistic level, but we, it doesn't take much, right? It's small but meaningful improvements, removing key points of friction, making sure people work in an environment that they feel as safe as possible, that they enjoy, that they can trust the people they work with, trust the manager, that they're going to do right by them and that they have a chance to do their best when they come in and clock in for every shift. So hopefully we can keep that front of mind and not slide back into some habits that I think we've seen in the past where associates know that they're being treated as if they're replaceable yeah. and they'll, they'll walk, especially if they have an opportunity to make 25 cents more down the street, they'll walk. And hopefully we recognize the impact that can have on our business. And Scott, the last word goes to you. Same yeah, question. I have a, a fairly strong opinion about this. Um, and, 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 you know, and it matches up. Uh, with with something I said earlier about what I see in in grocery or retail leaders versus those that are are really struggling, those that are focusing on three things, um, and and understanding the linkage between these three things uh, are are the ones that are on the leadership side of of my equation, and that is we've talked about all of them: transforming the customer experience, expanding the availability of insights, and the ability to sense and respond, and third you know, optimizing retail operations. The discussion today about associate empowerment, associate enablement impacts all three of those areas. And so while there are many other technology uh, and, and cloud and digital innovations that are affecting each one of those areas of focus and strategy independently, there is that common thread, um, as JD outlined a number of times, that if we maintain focus on, if we continue to actively invest in the associates that still, regardless of the amount of automation that we deploy in retail, are still a major contributor and component of the customer engagement, customer facing activity that any retailer has in their brand experience. That will be a retailer that is succeeding and is differentiating in this market. So we cannot uh, um, ignore how crucial the associate is across all of those three areas of retail focus. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who was watching this uh, Rethink Retail webinar. Um, if you'd like to follow J.D. Dillon or Scott Langdock on LinkedIn, they are uh, experts in their field and we'll have a lot to say. So um, thank you very much and uh, we'll see you later.